This is Houston Newsmakers with Cambrell Marshall. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. hard, hard. Engines on five, four, three, two. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. It was that moment 50 years ago when the first part of the challenge issued by President Kennedy eight years earlier was accomplished to put men on the moon. Apollo 11 did that, and Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins completed the first, the rest of that challenge, which was to come back safely. That mission forever changed the way we look at our space program and this country's ability to achieve. One of the men with a front row seat in this mission, and many others doing his more than 30-year career at NASA, was Gene Kranz, flight director for Apollo 11, many other missions. He exemplifies what American spirit and grit is all about, and among his many awards, Presidential Medal of Freedom, this country's highest civilian award. I'm honored this morning to have Gene Kranz as my guest as we talk about NASA, past, president, and future. Good to see got you, it. sir. Great to be here, sir. Always good to talk to you. We only got a chance to do that very shortly the last time we met, but we're going to talk about some more this time. This 50-year anniversary, this is a big milestone. Are you enjoying this? Uh, I am enjoying every moment, and a key to this enjoyment is to see my people involved. Mm. I mean, we've restored mission control. My teams are here. We've got the opportunity to relive these moments, and it's uh, it's a uh, it's it's emotional, it's visceral, it's physical. It's all of a sudden we're together as a team, and you want to sit down and say, "God, we were good. <laughs> okay, we were good. We were the best." You know, when I look back at the day of the lunar landing, and I know I remember hearing you when you spoke, you said that you told the crew that this is a day they remember the rest of their lives. How clear are those memories even today of what was going on on that day? It's, uh, it's almost a photographic image that I uh, still have because I, uh, I remember my final words to my team. These are young pups. These are 26, 27-year-old guys. And uh, when we finish talking, we're going to lock those control room doors, and we're not to go. They're not going to be open until we've either landed, crashed, or aborted. And I said, you know, I will stand behind every decision you will make. We came into this room as a team, and we will leave as a team. And basically, then I ordered the doors closed and locked. And from that moment, they won't be open. Those first steps on the moon. How how. Uh did it affect you? Obviously, it was something that you were seeing, everybody else was seeing at the same time, well, because we were nationally patched in at that time, were we not? Well, the, uh, the first steps on the moon were, were really key. By this time, I had finished my shift here and watched the press conference. I was thoroughly enjoying it. When we touched down, I had two hours' work, the world celebrating, <laughs> and basically, I got my team by the numbers. We're going to go through the stay no stay decision, stay no stay decision, stay no stay, ready to power down and hand over to another team. When you say stay no stay decision, that means once you land, how is it safe enough to stay, or do you just take right back that, off? That's exactly right. We had three points that if something had happened on board the spacecraft at two minutes, eight minutes, and two hours, that basically we could lift off the lunar module, it could act, do an active rendezvous with the command module there. So these were key decision points. And uh, it was very, I won't say frustrating, I just wish my team could go back and live the instant of the landing rather than continue working for two hours. Right, right. <laughs> That's the way our jobs are sometimes. Huh? <laughs> Your career has been documented through many videos, uh, watching you in Mission Control. Um, it, it, you started, though, not in Mission Control. How did you start? What were you aspiring to be as a young pup? You had young pups under you. You were a young pup once. What were your aspirations at that time? Well, basically, all I want to do is uh, be a fighter pilot. I grew up in in a, in a military boarding house. My father died, my mother basically opened up a couple rooms in the house for military personnel. So myself and my two sisters basically were infused with the duty, honor, country, sacrifice component of these people that lived at the house. And there are a lot of Navy people in here and I wanted to become a naval aviator. Not an aviator, a naval aviator. And I uh, got the uh, appointment to the Naval Academy, but unfortunately I failed the physical. I'd been working at two jobs to help support my mother mm -hmm. and uh, basically I was showing sugar so I had to find a new way and I was very fortunate that I had a couple teachers that picked me up 
said, never surrender. And basically, they got me on track. And I went to college, got an Air Force commission, and flew the fastest, best, sweetest, most beautiful fighters in the world. <laughs> well, you did that, and that would probably give you a chance to really kind of understand the mentality, the, uh, I don't want to say bravado, but the mentality and the attitude of the astronauts who were going to be coming into the program as well, because they had that same kind of philosophy, didn't they? How much of a help was that, having the understanding how they understood flight? I think this was, I think this, this was a, a great help. The Mercury astronauts came in, you know, they were rock stars. Uh, sometimes you felt, holy, will you just slow down a bit and let's talk. <laughs> let's talk about the spacecraft. But basically, virtually everybody that was in the early program uh, came from uh, aircraft background. Uh, Chris Kraft and the people came from Langley Research Center. We were fortunate as a result of a Canadian decision to cancel uh, an aircraft program was Avro Aero, which is the world's top performing aircraft at that time. Mm. They canceled the program, so we got some of their engineers and flight test people in here. So basically, we have this magic potpourri of young people that basically, somehow or other, when they mixed together, we became stronger as a team than we were individually. And it was just a marvelous time to grow up. And therefore, I think we are ready to address issues associated with the rock star astronauts. Well, and the, as I saw that, uh, all that happened in the relationship between you and the controllers and the astronauts themselves, you land on the moon, it's triumphant. But now the biggest thing is getting off, because you got to take off from a place that no one has ever taken off from, and that's another planet. And how fraught with uh, problems, potential problems, was that? You, uh, in mission control, you, uh, you spend an awful lot of time addressing the what ifs. Mm -hmm. And basically, there was one engine. But in case that engine didn't ignite automatically, we had all kinds of manual backups, ways to work around this thing. I was, the, you know, the young kids in mission control I had, uh, many of them came from the Midwest. A lot of them were farm boys, first in the family ever to go to, uh, go to college. Mm -hmm. So it was absolute delight to turn these people loose and say, what if this happens, what are we gonna do? And boy, they'd crackerjack answer. That whole process now, once you, saw it lift off, and I know it's the video of the camera, I guess it stayed on the moon, it's there now today yeah. probably, as the, as the module lifted off to go back up to, to rendezvous with uh, Collins. That whole process, I'm sure that, you know, were you on shift then or were you uh, watching it from? A no, I, I was a division chief, so basically each one of the flight directors had various activities in the missions. We had four flight directors on that mission, and basically each one had certain phases of the mission they had responsibility for. And basically, there's a lot of times when the mission where you want to sit back and watch other people work. Two reasons. One, it's a good way to learn because eventually you're going to do the same thing. You, you're going to handle the, the uh, lunar asset. I had that for the final three missions, the liftoff from the moon. And it's a, a time where uh, it's sort of like launch phase here. Split seconds, you got to make all the right calls. The crew has to be well trained. But fortunately, as a team, we were able to always keep these pieces together so that when the time came, we were ready, we did the job, the spacecraft worked. I had incredible confidence in the lunar module. Well, once it was in the moon, once it was in the moon, I knew it would work to get us up. And now when, the, when everybody came back and they landed, they're in the water, they're being picked up, uh, after you see the, 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 the module blast off and everybody's back home, tremendous, is that only then? Is that when you relax and you really start to do the celebration thing? Uh, you know, the thing that is uh, incredible there is to sit down and think that what America will dare, America can do. <laughs> and there it was an incredible time to sit down and see the power of a free and open society where this nation came together in unity to accomplish something that for generations people thought impossible. Right. But we did it, yeah. and we did it perfectly. The hardware worked. It was, it was always a matter of pride. I always get misty for the American flag when I get in the moon. Well, it was a start of what was a, a big uh, stage, setting the stage for something different. We're going to continue with uh, Gene Kranz after this. Uh, the Apollo did set the stage for a new generation of flight. You remember the new generation of flight. After Apollo, shuttle program took flight, led to a whole new world of space exploration, including building the International Space Station, which continues to operate. We'll talk more about that coming up.
And back with legendary NASA flight director Gene Kranz, and we talk about the lunar landing, what impact it had on space exploration. But I, you, I would, we talked off camera here just a second ago. You joined NASA before it was NASA. So you, there's a lot that went off. All manned flight took place after you joined. It was, uh, this was a very interesting time. I'd been working in a, a flight test program out at Holloman Air Force Base. I was flight test engineer in the B-52 aircraft. When the program ended, I was looking for jobs. I had the opportunity to go out to Edwards Air Force Base. I had a job opportunity there. Uh, General Dynamics wanted to teach me about rockets, but I saw an interesting advertisement in Aviation Week magazine that said they're looking for engineers to determine the feasibility of putting an American in space. And that sort of captured the imagination. I'd never done anything like that before. So I sent in the application, filled out the paperwork, and didn't hear anything for about six weeks. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I get a phone call that says, uh, are you still interested? And I said, yeah. They said, they gave me a reporting date. And I reported into uh, uh, Langley Research Center, which is where the headquarters was Space Task Group. And they put me in a bullpen of about eight or ten other people. And for about two weeks, uh, people would come in and say, you're going to launch operation, you're going to... Nobody wanted me. <laughs> okay. So all of a sudden, somebody comes in and taps me in the shoulder <laughs> and says, I'm Chris Kraft. You're working for me now. I want you to go down to the Cape, write a countdown, write some mission rules, and when you're through, give me a call and we're to launch. That was the first Redstone launch. Wow. I wrote the countdown for that guy. Wow. And I'd never been interviewed. <laughs> I never had any discussion with Kraft. All of a sudden, he sends me to the Cape. And, and there you were thinking nobody wanted you. Well, well, some, when I got the Cape, I was trying to figure out which direction the Cape was. From, <laughs> was it north or south of Patrick Air Force Base? I didn't have a clue. Well, you know, once you got there, of course, the Russians put uh, uh, a satellite up first, and then we came up. H how much of an impetus was that for the angst of the organization to get going and, and get us up and, and running. It was an incredible impetus for me because I'd served over in Korea and I'd come back from a flight one day and my crew chief ran up to me and says, you know, the Russians have launched a Sputnik. And I said, well, what's a Sputnik? He said, well, it's a satellite that goes around and goes beep, 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 beep. And I promptly forgot the doggone thing and went back to work and flying again. It was amazing. Years later, I'd hear this President Kennedy speech to Congress to go to the moon. And the or orbiter, the Sputnik, had been orbiting our nation for four years. And finally, somebody got mad enough to do something about it. One month prior to the Kennedy speech, we had blown up our second Atlas rockets. A couple weeks prior to the speech, we had launched Alan Shepard. We had a total of 20 minutes main space flight, main space flight experience. Uh, we'd never been to orbit. And President Kennedy says, not only go to the moon, but beat the Russians to it. Yeah incredible en energy out of the program at that time. I'm going to talk about the shuttle in a second, but one of the things that you're well known for as well is the mission that didn't go like it was planned, but we call it a successful failure. Is that what the terminology is? Apollo that's 13 right. I spent talking? a lot of time uh, speaking with Jim Lovell, and uh, basically that's what it's claimed. I, uh, I think it was uh, really a demonstration of the capabilities and capacities of a well-known, I mean, well-led well mission control crew on board the spacecraft team to solve an impossible problem. And it was, at the time we started, impossible. But we will never surrender. When that rocket went up, it was fine. It was, that was the liftoff there. And then there we have a shot of you in the control room before everything started to go hinky. You were there, and it was beforehand. Now, that is something they put together. I want to hold that there, uh, Ray, in the control room there. That's something the astronauts rigged up in order to help them get back, correct? Yes, what happened is that uh, we basically recycle the, uh, the atmosphere of the spacecraft. Uh, and what we got to do is remove the carbon dioxide from the crew's breathing. We have a chemical canister that does it, contains lithium hydroxide, but they were packed in a cylindrical form in the lunar module. And we had run out of those things. And engineering basically came back from a brief rest period, and engineering said, hey, uh, we got to remove that carbon dioxide because the partial pressure of the spacecraft is increasing. It's becoming deadly for the crew. And so it basically it was a fit square canisters and a round hole with a cardboard cover from a flight plan, big plastic bag we had on board, use the sock as a filter, and then lash it all together with duct tape. Done. All right. Okay. Easy, easy peasy. All right. Well, that was part of the reason that they were able to come back um, it, it, like they were there. Now, I'm sure that when they landed on the Iwo Jima there, that was a really good picture for you to see. And then it was time to go ahead and celebrate. Everybody celebrates at that point in time. And that 
was a part. People forget how many other missions there were. Apollo was active for yes. quite a few years, or 13, but you went back to the moon after that. And then the shuttle program. What, how big was the shuttle program in continuing to do the things that the Mercury and Gemini and Apollo were able to get started? The shuttle program was probably uh, the greatest challenge I personally had ever faced because I was the division chief of flight control and then I was moved into the as director of uh, uh, mission operations. And basically all of a sudden I had a complete turnover in my manpower. Uh, basically as many of the people that started Mercury were now retiring. And basically uh, they were the ones that had to be replaced. <clears throat> and uh, the tough thing is to teach young people to accept a responsibility. The work in mission control is not gray. It's always black or white, go or no go. And each one of these young people we brought in had to be conditioned to make hard decisions. Decisions, that's a decision place there. And uh, this was to the point where we established a boot camp for these young people. We tied them with some of the best operators that were remaining in that thing. So we set up a one-on-one -on -one relationship. We taught them what 12 hours, 14 hour days, or a lot of testing days mm -hmm. were about. And uh, this was the biggest challenge we had. The other one was addressing the uh, technology because now we had moved into a uh, technology that was, I mean, almost overwhelming in its capability five computers on board the <laughs> space shuttle. Four of the computers, what they call primary event, and they could vote against each other to say, are y'all working? Somebody wasn't working, vote them out. So now we got three computers controlling the spacecraft. So the technology of the shuttle, the aerodynamics, uh, was, I mean, this was a breakthrough. Well, it continues to be a breakthrough now. It's still up there operating. We're going to continue to talk with Gene Kranz after this break, including the, the restoration of mission control, how big that is, and how it really kind of takes the years off of uh, this guy who's been around for a little bit more than a couple. Back in a minute. Well, the much fanfare a couple of weeks ago, very special completion of the Mission Control Center, Johnson Space Center, back to nearly the exact way it looked during the heyday of the space race. You had work on this, didn't you, Gene? Yes, it was. That was a great challenge, but basically we uh, established a team. We uh, got some uh, commitment from Space Center Houston to help us find the resources. I learned what a Kickstarter was about because I was raffled off for $10,000 oh, a pop to do a tour. To raise so money So basically for it. Yeah. It, was, it was a team effort uh, beginning to the end and it, the product is incredible. I walked, the first time I saw that, I walked into the viewing room and this place is alive again. You know, it was, uh, it was interesting. I can go into Mission Control, walk in that door and I hear voices. I hear the voices of my team members making the calls. I hear, I walk in there and I can see, you know, groups over in the corner there working a problem. Yeah. And I said, my God, there's a problem in there. I wonder what's going on. I better find out. How important was it to you to get that thing done? So what's, it, what's, it, what's the value of having that there so people can see it and reminisce like you were able to? I think there's a, uh, there are certain things in life that uh, basically focus what we did as a team, what we did as individuals, where we stepped up to incredible responsibilities and basically moved our nation forward. You know, I look at the mission control and the work we did in space, sort of like the Panama Canal. Panama Canal basically tied two oceans together. Basically, mission control tied the Earth and deep space together. There were, there were hundred, there was hundreds of thousands of people who worked on the processes for what you did. How do you want to be remembered for your role? Uh, basically, uh, what I like is that basically the culture I established in mission, mission control, it's tough and competent. Tough meaning we'll take whatever actions we need for crew safety and mission success and we'll be accountable for them. That's it? That's it. It lasts a long time. It lasts a lifetime for those well, people who are under you. To me, it's interesting. I can go into Fortune 500 companies and I'll see the Kranz dictum, the speech I gave after the Apollo 1 fire. I'll see the foundations of mission control hanging in the wall. So there's, I think, some lessons. Every time I talk to kids, I use that same handout, every corporation. So basically, I'm spreading the word on what it takes to achieve excellence. Thank you for that. Thank you for your contributions to this community, this country, and to 
NASA for what you've done. It's been a pleasure. Great. Congratulations. Happy 50th. Happy 50th. You got it. You don't look a day over 35 or 40, I think. Well, I'll, uh, I'll uh, check that every once in a while. I'll say uh, for the mid-80s, I'm having a lot of fun. And you know, it's, 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 it's like neat it. to be old and still useful. Well, you are useful to all okay. of us. Don't go anywhere anytime soon, okay? Thank you very much, Camper. Right. Thank you, Gene. We'll be back. Big announcement about our next newsmakers coming up. A change in the coming weeks here for Houston Newsmakers. We will be off next week, moving aside for what is now known as the Open. I still call it the British Open, but by whatever name you call it, it's big enough to push us out of the way for next week. When we come back, we'll meet some candidates for mayor who are not getting the kind of attention that some of the big names are receiving, so I'll introduce you to some of them. And that'll be on Sunday, July 28th. You don't want to miss that. But next week, the celebration of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Fifty years ago, the world watched as KPRC Channel 2 broadcast man's first steps on the moon. The eagle has landed. Now, relive the wonder, feel the excitement. Hear from the people who made the mission possible. Houston's mission to the moon, Apollo 11, July 17th at 7. Proudly brought to you by our sponsors, BBVA and Circle K. Don't want to miss that. Well, thank you for your social media communications with me. You can follow me on Twitter at KPRC2 Cambrell, hashtag HOU Newsmakers. And you've been good about sending subjects or stories you'd like for me to take on through email at Houston Newsmakers at click to Houston.com. Keep it up. Thank you to Gene Kranz for making this Newsmakers a very special one. Have a great day, everybody. I look forward to seeing you back here again Sunday, July 28th.